So let's go ahead and get into dwellings of Eldervale. Long ago, there was a thriving kingdom of sprawling cities, breathtaking landscapes, and unparalleled magic known as Eldervale. It was a place of great wealth and diversity, powered by mystical orbs and elemental energy. At the height of its power, Eldervale was destroyed by a cataclysm of magical energy. Left in the ruins, the realms of Eldervale were forgotten. In the game, Dwellings of Eldervale, we all are going to control factions of, a mytho of mythological beings returning to Eldervale to rediscover its treasures, harness its powers, and ultimately build, wait for it, dwellings. It won't be easy. Other factions have the same inten intentions and powerful monsters still lurk in these forgotten lands. So what are you guys looking at here in general? Well, all right, so let's go over the main board here. So we have the main board comprised of elemental realm tiles. So there are a total of eight different elements in the game, four of which are pictured here. There are four underneath here, but we will show those off as we actually go through the game. But eight different elements, not all of them are available in every game. This being a four player game, we actually have six of the available elements available. These tiles here are made up of elementals, elemental uh, realm tiles, as well as various ruins. And the ruins have names on them, be them dungeons, portals, mills, fortress, mage tower, and another dungeon over there. Now we have a random tile placement out here. However, it is a set board shape based on the player count. So in a four player game, it's always going to be four there, three outside of that, and then two outside of that. Then over on the far left, we have the board of elements. We have the fame track or the victory point track around the outside, around, around the, the outside. outside. Uh, we have down below that, we have the orb reward options. Then below that, the main part of the board, we have the elemental power tracks for all eight elements. Again, only six of them are in play for us in a four player game. Ironically, Jess is in here, so we're in mourning, ergo, no green. <laughs> And to be honest with you, it kind of hurt me, but we took yellow out of the game <laughs> as well. So hopefully that doesn't throw off any regs to the show. Then down below that, we have the glory track. And below that, we have the underworld. Then we have the dungeon trays. And the dungeon trays are 3D printed as it is here. These have adventure cards for each element and they're labeled at, up top for what element they are. Then down below, there are various different uh, uh, treasure tokens, some of which are already on the board for setup. Then off board, over on the left-hand side there, we have magic, the magic card deck. Then we have the undiscovered elemental realm tiles. And then off camera, because let's face it, you guys don't need to see them, but we have resources. We have gems, potions, scrolls, tools, swords, and gold, and we'll go through all those. They're basically cubes as it is right now, but I believe in the final edition they're going to be, you know, in the shape of whatever right. it is that they are. Then around the board, we have the eight giant 50 millimeter minis for the different monsters. At the end of the stream, we will zoom in and show the detail of all of the uh, all of the monsters. These are, as they look, uh, they are unpainted as is, but they look awfully impressive. And you're talking to somebody who's not even super keen on minis, but the detail's really nice on those. Then also at the top here, we have five monster dice. Then on our player tableaus, we have a game tray that holds all of the player's items. So they have dwellings and then the various player units. We have a dragon. Now keep in mind that the, the actual 3D printed tray here, we only have some of the pieces. Obviously not all are custom shaped yet, but they eventually will be. So we have our dragon, which will go here, our warrior, our wizard, and then there are three workers as you see there. Then. There is a little cutout for all six of your combat dice. Then there are treasure slots. There are a max of four that you can have. And then there are resource trays. And we start with a resource of each. We actually start, let me fix this. There we go. We start with gems or a gem, a potion, a scroll, a tool, and a sword. And check that, I actually had it backwards. There we go, there we go, that's right. So we have resources for all of those. Gold can go into one of the other slots. 
and you can have a max of five of each of those. Then below that is the actual faction board. Now these faction boards actually snap into this, but I'm not going to show you guys that right now. And to be honest with you, all of this is flavor. It's pretty artwork, but to save screen real estate, we're going to do so like so, so that you can see everything down below it. But there we go. All right. Now our player faction board, this shows the different units and their special abilities. Each different faction has two special abilities. Some have it on the dragon and the warrior. Others have it on the wizard or workers, etc., etc. Everybody starts with three workers to start and one token here for the glory track. More on all of that later. In addition to that, we have a starter card, which is going to have for whenever we regroup our basic actions that are available. And we were all dealt five random magic cards. So that's all of the components that you guys have. Now, how do you actually play the game? Well, as an overview, before we get into the actual gameplay, kind of context, if you will. So Dwellings of Eldervale, it's a turn-based game, and beginning with the start player, which we did randomly draw, and it ends up being me, for better or for worse, each player takes a turn until the end of the game is triggered. So I'm going to take a turn, then Chris, then Jeff, then Ken, and we keep going round and round and round until the end of the game is triggered. The goal of the game is to score the most fame, or victory points, on that track. You're going, we're all going to be doing that various ways during the game. We're going to be winning battles against both ourselves, as, or against one another, I should say, as well as these various monsters. And when you win these battles, thus you're going to move up the glory track, and you're going to score victory points, as you can see anywhere you see the star symbol on there. Then you'll notice on the elemental track, there are orbs at the very top of those. Those orbs potentially can be worth victory points via orb actions as well as the orb rewards up top. Then there are playing various spell magic cards you're going to be able to gain victory points. Also there are quest cards within the magic deck which you may be able to uh, complete. Then there are going to be various tableau actions, so not these, but as we go along and unlock these and acquire these adventure cards, they're going to go into our tableaus and those may be worth victory points at the end of the game. And also there may be some monster effects that also give us some, uh, some victory points in game. Now, to be able to do those various things that get you those victory points or fame points, the game's core mechanic is really quite simple. On a player's turn, you do one of two things. You either place one of your units that is in your ready area, so meaning if it's out here, it's available, so I start with three workers. You place one of unit onto the board somewhere out here, and then you take the associated action based upon where they were placed. Or, in lieu of doing that, you regroup. You take all your workers from the board, as well as if you have any down here in the underworld, underworld <laughs> and you put them back down here in your ready area. Those are your two options on your turn. Simple enough, right? At the end, or at the end of the game, again, is triggered one of two ways. Either by players building their sixth and final dwelling. I mean, it is the name of the game after all, right? Or by a player drawing the last realm tile from the realm stack, add it to the board, meaning placing it back out here. At that point, each player gets one more turn, including the player who triggered the end of the game. And then we go into final scoring. Easy enough, right? Right. All right. So I'm not going to go over final scoring quite yet. I figure why not have context on what you're exactly trying to do in the game. So how do you play Dwellings of Eldervale? So on a player's turn, they're the active player. And again, they have two choices. Place a unit or regroup. To place a unit, well, every player has four types of units. Everyone has workers, three that are unlocked or available so far. There are three that you must uh, use a portal to be able to get. You also have one wizard, one warrior, and one dragon. You're going to choose one of the available units from your ready area on your player board, place it onto the main board into one of the realms. If it's your first unit on the board, whether it's the first turn or you had previously regrouped, you, it must go 
to your choice of an unoccupied realm. An unoccupied realm means no player's units, yours or others, or monsters. So on the very first turn of the game, you can see that a monster occupies this realm. I can place my worker because, again, that is the only uh, unit that I have available. I could place one of these in any realm or tile out here on the board except for the one with him because it's occupied. So I could go here, I could go there, there, etc., etc. Easy enough, right? Right. Now, I should point out that as we go along and players build these tableau or build these dwellings, dwellings do not count as <coughs> occupied, so you can place where there are dwellings if it's your first worker or first unit. I'm sorry. Now, subsequent units must be placed adjacent in an adjacent realm to one of their own units. So, for instance, if I were to have placed my unit here on subsequent turns when I wish to place another unit, my options are here, 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 or here. I also can place if there were, and indulge me, if say Chris went there on his first, once you have a unit on the board, then you may occupy a realm that has another unit in it, be it another player, multiple, or uh, another player, or if I had placed here first, let's say I'd gone there, and I could then place where there's a monster. You're going to have to take my word for it. He's big. Let's, there we go. There. All right. You can do so. What you cannot do, though, ever, is place where you have a unit already. So if I had placed here originally, my options are these six realms or tiles around to be able to place, but I cannot place there. If it were my first one, I could not place here or there. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions? Makes sense. All right. All right. Normally, when you place a unit that has another player or a monster's unit there, usually a battle at this point will ensue at the end of your turn. And I'll, I'll go into more detail about that as we go along. Okay? Now, all of the special units have special placement rules, or, or advanced units is another way of thinking about them. Dragons, you'll see, have flight. These can be placed up to two realms away from an adjacent unit. So basically, they can go one further. They don't have to be directly adjacent. Easy enough. The wizard has teleportation, and this is true across all factions, all players. So the wizard, with their teleportation, can be placed in any unoccupied realm. So going back as an example, if it were my dragon, I could place my dragon here because I'm allowed to go one further. There. Yeah, that's easy enough. My wizard can go to, well, anywhere that isn't occupied. So I could go there. Easy enough. Then, last but not least, is the warrior. And the warrior has aggression. So even if it's their first placement, you may place in an occupied realm. So if I had already acquired my warrior on my tableau like so, then if I choose to place him as my first placement, I could just say, come on, big boy, let's let's dance. That's okay. <laughs> yep. Or I could go there or could go to an unoccupied. But that's your warrior's special ability, and that is aggression. All right? Now, each faction, in addition to those things, may have special abilities. So, for instance, my dragon here has Plunder and Valkyrie, and we'll go over those when we're about to get started. Don't want to get lost in the weeds with those right now. Okay? So, place a, place a unit out there. Okay, there's the first part of it. Then, you must carry out the associated action of the realm that the unit was just placed in. If you cannot carry out the associated action of that realm, you cannot place your unit there. So these ruins have special rules about them, so the name locations, whereas the other ones, you're always going to be able to carry out the action. All right? Now, again, there are two different types of tiles out here. There are elemental tiles. Elemental tiles have treasure tokens on them, as you can see there, or they are named Ruin tiles. Elemental realms, really easy. Choose one treasure token. So if I place here, if there are two stacks, I get my option of either of the face-up top ones. If I had placed down here, I choose the top one. 
Pretty simple. So what happens in that case? I take the top one, it comes into my Tableau, I place it into there, I have spot for four, if I have four, I can't take another. Easy enough. More likely what you would do, you would then cash it in, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there you go. Place a worker, take a treasure token. Okay, easy enough. However, on ruins, well, each named ruin has a special uh, action associated with it that, again, you must carry out. So starting with the Mage Tower over here, the Mage Tower says you can spend any two resources to allow you to draw three magic cards and add them to your hand. Everybody starts with five. You can add three, and then you must discard one from your hand. So you will have, if it's your first action potentially, you could then have as many as eight, maybe nine, depending on what you've done, cards in your hand, but you must discard one. It doesn't have to be one of the ones that you just drew. At the end of your turn, your hand limit, seven cards, all right? There are now three types of magic cards. So as I like to call them, they are sparkle cards for the first one. Those have a little sparkle symbol on it, all right? These are spell cards. These are playable when the card says it can. They're single use, they may have a, ca a casting cost on it. So in this case, there are two potions that you would have to spend, or if you were up to level three on the dark track, on the power track like there, you would have to be at least to level three. And in addition to that, you would have to be leading it. Not tied, but leading. Meaning, if you were not leading, you have to pay two potions. And then it says, play on your turn and do whatever the special stuff says on it. Easy enough, right? Then there are prophecies. Prophecies have the little eyeball. What these are, are end game scoring cards, but they have to be in your hand at the end of the game to be able to score, all right? That's the only time in which they score, so if you still have them in your hand at the end of the game, they're worth points to you. Then there are quests that have the little sail uh, boat on it or sail ship as it were. These are in-game immediate fame points or victory points when they're played. They, uh, they can be played when a player meets whatever the requirement it says to complete this quest. You must win a battle with your warrior, gain four fame. Easy enough, that's pretty straightforward, okay? Now, I should also point out that magic cards are also resources when you can spend any resources. There are going to be instances where it says discard a resource or whatever. Magic cards can be used as resources in that case. So you start with five of them. They're essentially wilds in that regard, but they cannot be used in lieu of specific resources. They can't be potions, they can't be or gems, potions, scrolls, etc. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions on the Mage Tower? And again, discard, see, treasure tokens or treasures? You could discard two magic cards and or a magic card and some other resource, gain three, discard one magic card. Easy enough. Moving on to the Fortress, which is right down below. This is, again, discard any two resources for two gold. Gold are wild resources. These can substitute for any other resource. They can be tools, they can be scrolls, etc., etc. All right, then moving over to the summoning portal right <laughs> here. This is how you make available more of your units. You pay the cost as indicated on your faction starter card. So let's take a look at that. So your faction starter card has some amount of resources down below. To unlock your first worker, or as it were, your fourth worker, since you start with three, any one resource, including a magic card you could discard. Two, three, respectively. To unlock your wizards, two potions and a scroll. To unlock your warrior is two tools and a sword. And to unlock your dragon is two potions and a scroll. All right? So you pay the associated cost on your starter card, then you move the summon unit into your ready area, and once it's summoned, including your starting units, they stay summoned for the remainder of the game. So hey, I have a dragon for the rest of the game. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, so that is the summoning portal. Any questions on that? Good, moving on. All right, so we have the, uh, the mill over here. This is how you construct a dwelling. And again, the game's namesake is Dwellings of Eldervale. So this probably leads you to believe that it's an important thing to do. 
you choose one of your workers to lose permanently that's out on the board. So for instance, let's say I had my workers out here like so, all right? I'm going to choose one of those workers to become a dwelling. Then I have to pay the cost as shown on the realm where that worker is. So this one can't be used, but in the top left corner of any elemental realm, meaning non-ruin, uh, you'll see that it has a picture of a dwelling and a couple of resources, possibly a few. Some only have a single resource. You pay the associated resource or gold in that case, and it cannot have a dwelling of any player already in that re in realm, and it's a limit to one dwelling per location, per realm. Then you place any of your dwellings right here, right on top, and hey, that worker just became <laughs> a dwelling. So that's a permanent thing. Normally, we'll just put it there to show that it's been used, and boom, done. We now have a dwelling on there. You're going to score two points for each dwelling in an adjacent realm, it does not matter if it's yours or someone else's. So as it were, if this were like this, I would score two points for having an adjacent dwelling next to that one. In addition to that, going to score two victory points for each ruin that is adjacent to that, to that dwelling. So I will have scored two, four, and six points. We would peg the four points on the fame track or victory point track, boom, that is done. Now dwellings are permanent and they will score victory points at the end of the game. In addition to that, during the game, they provide an additional die in battles that take place in that realm or in adjacent realms to that. So keep that in mind. That's going to help out for battles. All right? Any questions on building dwellings? Nope. nope. Makes sense. You talk about moving up the track. Oh, yeah. Also, uh, when you build a dwelling, you're also going to go up that elemental track. So if I built this dwelling, there is one wind or air marker, so I'm going to move up one power, uh, one of the elemental power tracks that match it. If, in this case, Chris had built this dwelling, he will have moved up two on the fire track. If he does not have a marker on there, that's where the extra markers over there. And each player will have an additional three for a total of four of the elements tracks. If ever you want to advance on a fifth track, you then f choose one track to forfeit any, any gains on and then move it over to whatever track you just went up. Does that make sense? Yep. Sense. All right. The last available type out here are dungeons, and I should point out that there are two dungeons, and these were randomly put out here, so that's why they ended up where they did. Now, dungeons are how we discover new realm tiles, as well as go on adventures. Whee! Now, we're going to flip the top realm, and we'll go ahead and do so just for an example, and then we can shuffle this up. So if, on my turn, I went over here, take these guys back, let's say it were my first one, I go ahead and do so there. It says grab a tile, top one, and place it. When I place it, it must be adjacent to at least two different tiles. So in this case, maybe I place it right here where that is. Maybe I place it over here. But just to keep things nice and neat, let's say I place it right there like so. I place any associated treasure tiles on the new tile. So you'll notice that it has one slot. What does that mean? We get one of the stacks of tiles, of treasure tiles, and there are three in each stack. We turn them face up. I'm not going to and ruin the surprise. So these would normally be face up like the others and go on there. Then if it shows the layer token, which this one does, we then make a sound effect. Thank you. And place the associated colored monster onto that location. In addition to doing so, we are then going to put out their card and we'll read this aloud to whatever their special ability is. It shows how many dice they get, etc. And I'll actually bring it over here so you guys can see it. It is the Iron Golem. It's invul invulnerable, special ability, and if you defeat it, what happens and how many combat dice. But we'll go into details on that here in a little bit. But placing the tile is really simple. Place the tile adjacent to any two. Place treasure tokens if or whether it's one or two stacks, and if it has a layer, put the associated monster out there. There are three of each color or of each elemental tile. One has a single, one has a double, and uh, check that. Two have doubles, one have a... Whoo! 
One has a double, two have singles, one of which has a monster on it as well. So the layer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is the first part. That is placing a new <coughs> elemental tile. And remember, when all of these are placed, that triggers the end of the game. That's one of the two triggers. Then after that, you'll notice that there are two pictured adventure cards. So at that point, and we'll go ahead and show you guys all eight here for now, you're going to choose one of the available six adventure cards that are face up. Now, again, green and yellow being out of our game, we just chose those to be out of the game, so these will stay locked and there is no way to unlock them. Those are essentially out of the game, but they look pretty, so we kept them in here. So, you choose one of these to acquire, and let's say, for argument's sake, I go ahead and choose, hand me one more scroll, if you could. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. So, coming over to our tableau. This shows the what uh, element it's uh, associated with. It also shows the associated cost in which to claim this adventure card. So in this case, it would be two scrolls, or if I had any gold, it would be that. I would have to discard the two scrolls, and then I would put this over here in my player area. And now, when we get to the regroup step, this is going to give me additional bonus actions that I'm going to be able to play, okay? Now, uh, yeah, easy enough. In addition to that, you're going to increase the matching <coughs> elemental power track by one, so this would go up by wind. So again, that would, if I'm already on there, I would move up. If not, we would place one of the tokens on there, okay? Then you may choose, after doing so, and now I have this, now I may choose a second card in which to purchase. If I cannot, or I choose not to, I then must bury one of them. And notice we do not flip this face up at this point. So let's say, you know what, I don't want that one for whatever reason. I then take this card, bury it to the bottom of the deck. Then at that point, we're going to flip up new cards, and we'll do and we'll explain those as we go along throughout the playthrough. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Any questions on that? No question. All right, so you're always going to be flipping up two new ones no matter what, because you must purchase the first, you may purchase the second, if you choose not to, you must bury it, okay? So again, to recap, you're going to place a single unit, then if it's an elemental realm, game a treasure token or a resource. If it's a ruin, do the associated action. If you have no more units to place, or even if you do, in lieu of placing a unit, you can choose to regroup. There's one other thing I want to mention real quick. If all of the tiles have already been removed, whatever's printed, that's what you get. Get a scroll, for instance, okay? All right. So let's talk about regrouping. So let's say I went ahead, I had my workers out there like so. Now we're talking about the second option, which is regrouping. So one by one, you're going to retrieve your units from the main board of the realms and place them onto your tableau actions to perform the action, or if you can't, or choose not to, place them back into your ready area. What does that mean? Well, let's say I choose this one first. He's going to come back, and now looking at my tableau, I start with three actions that are available to workers. I happen to have workers. So I could place this here, and I would get one scroll from the supply to add in. Easy enough. Then, after that, he's done, or she, as it were, I grab another worker. I then can choose one of those two. I cannot carry out multiple of the same, so I can't do two on that, so I couldn't get two scrolls, as it were. And these can be done in any order. Remember earlier, I had that extra action over here? I could, however, do like so, place one there, then I can get one potion. So I would have gotten a scroll and one potion to add into my supply here, all right? Then I would retrieve my last worker, and if I choose to do the portal action, which looks a whole lot like the summon portal, in fact, it's the exact same thing, so I could then summon any of those available uh, units up there, paying the associated cost just like we did. But let's say I didn't have the resources or whatever I didn't want to, then he just comes back to the ready area. In addition to that, if I had any workers or units down here in the underworld, they would then come back and come into my ready area. 
So it's kind of like if you've ever, like Concordia or anything else, it's basically picking up your deck, or in this case, picking up your workers. But in addition to that, you get a little worker placement action that's only usable by you. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. All right. Now, in addition to those two things, those are your two main actions. In addition to that, you have free anytime actions. So you can discard a treasure token at any time to gain whatever the rewards are. So if I had this token, I could discard it and get two scrolls at any time. I can do, if I had four of those, I could do them all at the same time whenever I want. They're called anytime actions for a reason. Or I could play a spell card. Again, spell, sparkles. So if, here, play after battle dice have been rolled, so at any time, wherever the card actually says it can be played, then you can play that at that associated time. Another thing you can do is slot a treasure token into a tableau action. So you notice here, there's this empty slot. Well, the, instead of turning this in for two scrolls, I could go ahead and place this right here like so. So now, whenever I take this during a regroup, action he not only gets one potion but in addition if i am leading on the cloud uh, tab, uh elemental track which oh hey looky there i am leading and tide is not leading but if i were leading i not only get the potion i get two additional <coughs> scrolls nice bonuses that stays there like luggage that will stay there forever unless i choose to replace it with another tile. If I choose to do so, I can either just cover it like so or discard the one below it. You do not get the one you just replaced. Okay? Any questions on that? The others I'm going to very quickly go over. There are bonus uh, orb bonus spaces at the top. If anybody acquires any of these orbs as we go along, they can go ahead and turn them in for any of those. Also, there are slots on some special cards that require orbs you can place that to activate that card or to kind of like make it go as it were or there are also um, orb slots for input costs that require an input to then output kind of like how these require two uh, resources into that it an orb makes that a cost of zero for the input cost Okay, mm -hmm. so those are the anytime actions. I think that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Last thing really that we need to go over now is battle, which there's gonna be a whole lot of battles going on here. So you know what, we'll go ahead and leave that there. So on my turn, after I've regrouped, everything comes back into my player area, and on my next turn I can place a worker, or any unit as it were. All right, so on my turn, I place out here, everybody will place. Let's say Chris went ahead and went there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then on a subsequent turn, maybe I go ahead and do that. And for simplicity's sake, let's say he's somewhere off over here. When I place that, you carry out the normal action on that tile as you would normally. At the end of that, there will be a battle, usually. Now I say usually because until each player has it taken their regroup action? The game is said to be at peacetime and no battle can take place. So the first time that you take a regroup action, there's going to be one token on your player ready area here. You're going to take this and you're going to place it over on the glory track. When every player has a marker up there, game on, now we can battle, <laughs> all right? Mm -hmm. So it, let's assume that everybody had a marker up there in the glory track already. When a player places a unit on a location with another player's unit, at the end of their turn, a battle will ensue. So if I place that there, we're going to have a fight. If, let's say, I placed this one, say, there, and then on a subsequent turn, I place there. If there's a monster, we will have a fight. In addition to that, when a player places a unit on a location with either a monster or adjacent to a monster, the monster will then move to their realm and a battle will ensue at the end of their turn. So if I place this here, not only are we going to fight, but then the monster is going to... Thank you, and come on over, all right, at the end of my turn. What does that mean? I then 
claim one of the treasure tokens just like normal and after I do so or if we were over here or wherever I would carry out the entire action then a battle will ensue. That right there is called a monster rush. If two or more monsters would rush a realm, the active player chooses which one rushes. So no more than one monster can occupy the same realm at the same time. So after I've carried out the action, here we go, game on. So this is how a battle works. Units from adjacent realms may join the melee. What does that mean? Well, the battle's taking place here. I have a unit here. If I want, I can be like, you know what? More is better. Fight on my side. That'll work. Now, if someone else had another unit out there, they could also join the fracas. <laughs> Even if they were not already previously engaged. So if Ken had a worker that was somewhere out there adjacent, he also could join the fricus. It starts to the left of the active player and finishes with the active player deciding. So technically, I would not choose until Chris would go first. Then, obviously, if Jeff had anybody adjacent, then Ken would. And then finally, maybe I get in there to get my feet hands wet. All right? Now, if there were any dwellings adjacent, so let's just say this were here, okay? They're going to add one additional die for that player. However, if Chris did not have a worker in that low or a unit in that area, that would not add a die. You have to have a unit for a dwelling to add additional dice. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. All right. <clears throat> Then we're going to determine combat dice. Well, each unit gets their associated number of dice. Workers normally get one. Warriors normally get two. Wizards normally get one. Dragons normally get three. That's good, all right? Then, again, dwellings in a realm and an adjacent realm add one die. So in this case, I have two, so I would get two of my dice that slide out of the handy dandy little holder, so I would have two dice in which to roll. Then we look here, Chris would get one for his worker and one for his dwelling. Jeff says, I'll let you guys go at it. Ken would, uh, on a suicide mission, would get one, but if he has a additional bonus, he would actually get two for his special right. ability. And also the, uh, where is he? The storm gets five. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're going to all roll our die, dice simultaneously. There we go. Highest die wins. So as we look at this, you'll notice that the monster rolled a 6, then a 5, then a 4, etc. So in this case, well, let's see. I rolled a 6, 2. Ken rolled a 4. Sorry. Ken rolled a 2. There we go. So who won this? The monster did because he rolled a 6-5. You compare the highest die of each player, and if still if tied, move down to the next die. In that case, the monster rolled a 5, I rolled a 2, so I'm the last one standing, so the monster would beat everybody. So in that case, everybody goes on over to the underworld. But the good news is, Everybody, every unit over there gets one sword for every unit. So I would get two swords, Ken would get one, Chris would get one, all right? The sword uh, represents vengeance for the fallen. Mm -hmm. They will return during your next regroup super pissed, <laughs> really, really angry, and with more swords. <laughs> there is one more step that I actually forgot. I apologize. In addition, after we have added all of our units, we then could spend any swords that we have to add one more die to combat. I apologize about that. So for every die, for every worker or for every unit, you get their associated dice. For every dwelling, you get one additional if it's yours. And then you may spend one or more swords to a maximum of six dice. You have six dice. So if, for instance, you had a dragon, which is three, and a worker, which is four, you could actually only spend two swords for a total of six dice to be able to go up in con combat against anybody there, okay? Mm -hmm. If a monster wins, it stays there. Everybody else dies, okay? If a player wins, they get to advance on the glory track and gain the benefit shown. Victory points or whatever, etc., etc., okay? 
If a monster loses, however, it's removed from the board, likely for the rest of the game. So we will then shh. <laughs> out of the game, it goes away, boom, done. There are instances in which they can come back, but we'll cover that when that comes up, okay? That's pretty much it. We go round and round and round until this deck runs out, or if one player has placed all six of their dwellings, then everybody takes one additional action, and then we go into final scoring. My turn. Huh? Yeah. Well, well, one last turn, yeah. fair point, all right? Scoring is each elemental power track scores victory points shown, shown next to the track, so wherever your markers are, score two to five. If it's not on the track, you score zero. Dwellings score victory points equal to the realm it inhabits elemental power track. So here you'll notice on the uh, wind track here, if there, that would be worth four points. All right, if he had another that was on the uh, fire track, whatever, he would score four points for that, wherever mm -hmm. that is on the track. Then uh, I should point out that a double elemental on that tile does not give you score it twice all that means is when you uh when you built a dwelling on that you will have moved up two times right. on that but right. it will not score double at the end of the game then any tableau cards that have any victory point things on them this one does not but if there are uh you're going to score based on what that is as well as i should point out whatever element that is you're also going to score based on your uh elemental number meaning i have one wind if i had two of these and i were on the three track there i would actually score three points per for a total of six for those also should point out that your starter card also counts as one of that so in this case i would have two of those cards does that make sense yeah yep. all right then any prophecy cards that you still have in hand at the end of the game Remember those eyeball ones? If you have any of those, at the end of the game, this card would be worth three if your marker, yada, 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 as it says. Highest score wins. If tied, most resources left over, including magic cards, wins. And that is how you play Dwellings of Eldervale. That worked for you? Got it. Great. Yeah. May I? Yeah, sure. absolutely. So um, it was corrected on stream okay. that the spell cards do not require you to be the highest. It's just having a certain number of levels, which ah, I Ah, there we go. Okay. okay. Um, sort of thing. Yep, there you go. Worker slots are wild. You can put dragons and yeah, wizards yeah. there. I thought that was implied, but glad yeah. you pointed that out. There are some cards, though, that have like a warrior, warrior slot. Warrior one, which is yeah, specific, specific yeah. one, right. You may... Well, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, workers... Are, me, if there is a worker symbol on it, means any unit... If it's a specific unit, if it shows a specific unit, in that case, it's that specific unit. Right. All right, continue. Most free actions are only during your turn, but getting resources is any time, literally any time, and playing the spell cards is whenever the spell cards say you can play them. Right. There we go. Anything and, else? Uh, active player, if multiple things happen at once, active player chooses the timing. Correct. And most importantly, when you play the warrior guy, the correct thing to hear in your head is the warrior by scandal. <laughs> Just clearing that up.